It's been a really long time since I've made my update to a Gate Guardian list, and I was almost going to create another update saying the best way to play Gate Guardian is with Floodgates. Unfortunately, the April 2024 ban list kind of threw that in a whirl, because uh, some of them got banned, Antispell got limited, so there is just a lot of Floodgate-oriented cards that no longer could work with Gate Guardian, or that Gate Guardian could no longer use, and therefore kind of weakening the strength of the Floodgate build that I was going to create. But little did I know that a way better, more consistent, and more sufficient Gate Guardian build has been under my nose this entire time. So what do I mean? What I mean is, ever since Gate Guardian came out, we have been waiting for a way to play the deck efficiently off of just two cards, right? And you can do that within the Gate Guardian engine, but there are only three different cards that you can play that kind of work the way that you want Gate Guardian to work, right? And that's Shadow Ghoul, Wall Shadow, and Labyrinth Heavy Tank, because those are the three that put your Gate Guardian names into the Spell and Trap Zone. And then you can then banish your Gate Guardian names, and you just need any two between the three of them to make your Gate Guardian fusions going first. And it's really low ceiling. You can play under Nibiru. You can play under a lot of different cards. I'm assuming that it's double wall shadow. You can play under skill drain. You can play under a lot of different stuff. So that's why floodgates were really good with it. You can play under summon limit. Not only was it inconsistent sometimes, but it was also difficult to find other cards to put in with the gate guardian engine without overcompensating for something. And therefore you're drawing more bricks than you need. Like the actual gate guardian names themselves are bricks. And you have to be honest with yourself about that if you're going to play this deck. Like, you are playing three bricks in your deck, what can you do about that? And the best thing you can do is try not to make them bricks as much as possible. Minimize the number of bricks you're playing in your deck. Try to build more towards playing more non-engine to make up for it. Some people would play, like, Sacred Swords of Seven Stars or stuff like that to make use of if you draw them in your opening hand. Because if you draw them in your hand, that means you need access to all three elements to make use of them. Earlier this year in Phantom Nightmare, Dark Guardian came out. And as cool as Dark Guardian is for being able to recycle your elemental pieces from the Banished Pile back into deck and kind of like make it more use of them, it's also the biggest brick in the deck because it requires the deck to work before it can be played. And yes, although it can summon itself from hand or graveyards, and you can even summon it off of the new gate guardian spell card dark element this card being a main deck monster was just not the right call i think i think this card should have been a fusion monster that you summon from the extra deck the more that i play tested with it the more i kind of wish this card was a fusion this card being a main deck monster just makes it really hard to navigate it working in branded is very limited it's really hard to make this work in branded just because you have so many you're trying to make the three elements work already and then having dark guardian on top of that is just really difficult so it's harder actually to mix Gate Guardian with other archetypes if Dark Guardian is in the mix. So that's one thing that I realized. When the new White Wood, you know, pseudo Bayonetta archetype was announced, right? The origins of Diabell Star and Diabells, I didn't think much of it, but I did see a, a, a Yu-Gi-Oh! organization article kind of like messing around with the idea of Gate Guardian with the White Woods. And then it clicked because I'm like, wait a minute, if Everything in the white wood engine needs to send a spell or trap to resolve its effect, and I can easily, easily get two spells and traps that I don't care about to send to grave off of just one wall shadow. That seems like it's pretty a pretty good trade-off, right? A pretty good deal. And I could even send the gate guardian spells and trap cards to graveyard uh, and then get their effects to search, so that even if I only get like one wall shadow. I can still get potentially two to three spells and traps to resolve my white woods for free, basically, and then still be able to play with something like either combined or wind and water. Then the question is, what is the white wood uh, deck capable of? And the answer is a lot. The two cards that we need to start with are not Piri Rai Map or Shadow Ghoul, but I put these two cards here to show you just how searchable both of these cards are. So you can resolve the Piri Rai map to search the Asteria of the White uh, of the White Woods, and you can use Shadow Ghoul to search the Labyrinth Wall Shadow. Now, the one drawback to Piri Rai map is that you have to pay half your life points. But if you know how Gate Guardian works, you understand that this is not actually a drawback. This is a feature, and you know Shadow Ghoul already. It searches out the the Wall Shadow 
And if you happen to have Wall Shadow on, on your opponent's turn, it can be used as a battle trap in the graveyard to pop an opponent's monster during uh, battle. But yeah, we're basically going to Wall Shadow. Wall Shadow is going to get to place us a name. It doesn't matter which name it is. We're going to go for Hysteria and we're going to send the Field Spell. We're actually not going to send our Kaze Jin yet. And the beautiful thing about this is we actually have a way to recycle the Field Spell from Graveyard. And that is what makes this more potent than other Gate Guardian variants. Because this was almost what I wanted Earthbound to be able to do but Earthbound could not get to Kraken first turn consistently. This being able to do what Earthbound couldn't makes this a superior deck. And also it has a way better engine as well. We'll, we'll get a little more into that as well. Asteria sends a Spell or Trap to summon a Spellcaster Tuner from deck. We summon out the Sylve, and Sylve on summon gets to add a White Forest Spell or Trap from uh, deck to hand. And the White Forest Spell we're gonna add is the Legend of the White Forest, right? Now, we can immediately Synchro Summon into Rosalia, Wicked of the White Woods, and on Summon, it could send a Spell or Trap from hand to, or field to the graveyard to add a White Forest card or Light Spellcaster monster from deck to hand. And that's important because we can send the Spell and Trap that we just searched to add another White Wood card from our deck to our hand. The beautiful part about that is that we're going to have two different triggers in our graveyard. First, we're going to have a Steria trigger because a spell or trap card was sent to activate a monster effect. So she gets to summon herself back from the graveyard. And she doesn't even get banished when she, when she leaves the field this way. She just gets to summon herself back. And secondly, Legend gets to actually reset itself to the field when it's sent to the graveyard to activate a monster effect. And because it's a normal spell card, it can still be activated that turn. So essentially, Legend is a free discard or cost material for one of your white wood effects before you actually sh resolve its real effect assuming that you didn't hard open it but you get to set the white wood summon out hysteria and now we're going to immediately synchro summon again because our level six synchro is a tuner into our diabelle fiendus of the white forest on summon if she synchroed using a tuner synchro monster she gets to target any spell and trap in graveyard and add it back to hand. Meaning our Labyrinth Wall Shadow, this is just a way more consistent and deliberate way of... Goddamn fireworks. This is just a way more consistent and deliberate way of getting double Wall Shadow re resolved in the same turn. So now we're going to go Wall Shadow again. Wall Shadow is going to place our Suijin and now we get to banish both. Go for our Winded Water. Now, here's the funny thing. Suijin, I mean, Wind and Water here is actually a spellcaster as well. So if you only opened like double wall shadow and nothing else, you would still be able to resolve Legend of the White Forest. Because you would still because Wind and Water is still a spellcaster. So you'd be able to start your turn without using your normal summon here either. But Legend of the White Forest gets to add us our Rosette from our deck to our hand. Now Rosette gets to drop one to summon itself from hand. And the one that we're going to drop is the one that we searched. Now, all the White Woods uh, spells and trap cards have the same effect, right? They get to reset themselves to the field when sent to the graveyard to activate a monster effect. So it's essentially a free discard. So all of this we're generating off of two cards. So now Woes gets to reset itself. And now Rasi is the only one that like, or not the only one, but she, she's like a really decent extender. And she doesn't really care about sending spells and traps to the graveyard, but she gets to summon herself from hand while you control a white wood monster or white forest. Could send a spell and trap from field to grave to draw a card. We're not going to at, at the moment because wall shadow is still good protection and we're, gonna, we're keeping the white forest here for a reason. So here's a beautiful thing about both Sylve and Rasia of the white forest. Both of them have an effect that is a quick effect in the graveyard where you can return a white forest or white wood synchro monster that you control or in your graveyard back into the extra deck and then special summon it with its effects negated. Now that's significant because that basically allows you to continue extending without needing to fill your extra deck with like a lot of fluff. Essentially it allows you to keep a tighter package and still be able to reach the same ceiling. And because they're quick effects, if your opponent tries to let's say bestial or do whatever, you can then chain one of your white forest cards to put back your synchro in case they decide to do that for whatever reason i don't think they will but in case they do so now we have two level four light tuners on our field diabelle 
Winded Martyr and a level two non tuner. Now you would think, oh, maybe we go into a level six synchro here. No, we're going level eight into the Visus Emery Tara. And this is actually really great because Emery Tara is one of the only synchros in the game that does not need a non tuner. It, it simply needs one tuner plus one light monster. Now you may get that confused with Chaos Angel because Chaos Angel doesn't need a tuner, right? Because Chaos Angel needs one tuner plus one or more non-tuner dark monsters, dark or light monsters. Whereas uh, Chaos Angel, you can treat any light or dark monster as the tuner. So uh, you don't need a tuner for Chaos Angel, whereas you need, whereas like you don't need a non-tuner for Beastus Amri Tara. Now Amri Tara on summon gets to add us our Manadium reframing because uh, it's a Manadium spawn trap card that mentions uh, Starfrost. Now we're gonna send these two off to summon our Ultimaya. And this is really good because now um, Ultimaya gets to trigger off of us setting the Manadium reframing. So we get a free Crystal Ring here, which is really good. So how many interactions are we sitting on here? We're sitting on Crystal Ring, we're sitting on Double Spell and Trap Negate with Wind and Water, and we're sitting on a reframing. That is three different layers of protection. Maybe they could be super polyed away, but we would still be able to get reframing here. And there is still one more interaction that we haven't accounted for yet. So, before our turn ends, we're going to shuffle back our Diabell, the level 8 Synchro, to summon out Rosia, but we're not going to use her for a Synchro Summon this turn. What we're going to do instead is we're going to wait till our opponent's turn for them to do something, right? Let's say they summon their first monster. On that summon, we can resolve Woes of the White Forest to summon out Syl from deck. Now, what Woes does is that it summons a White Wood monster from hand or deck, and then immediately after this effect resolves, you get the option to synchro summon a white wood monster. So you would think, oh, well, we're going to make a level six, right? But we don't actually have to use the monster that we summon to synchro summon. As long as we have the materials on field beforehand, we can use any two monsters to synchro summon. And that's why we summoned Rasia um, before the end of our main phase last turn. So that we can use it and uh, our level two to make Silvera, Witch Wolf of the White Wood. When Silvera is summoned, she is a Book of Eclipse for the opponent's field. It's non-targeting, non-destruction, pretty good removal, relatively speaking, because it's pretty free. And it's like, if they don't have a quick effect or an effect on summon on their monster, and you, you suspect that they're about to link or synchro summon or exceed summon, you can just hit them with the Silvera at the right time. And that might potentially stop their plays. You could also chain block. So, Sylve is being summoned here off of the trap card, and it can be chain link one to search you a white forest spell or trap. Silvera can be chain link two to book a moon. And then your reset in graveyard, if a, a life spell caster tuner monster is pushed into your field during your opponent's turn, while this is in the graveyard, it gets to add itself back to hand. And because the synchro is a tuner, it can trigger off of summoning the synchro during your opponent's turn. And it's a great starter for, and great follow up for going for turn three and onward, meaning we're gonna get our Book of Moon and we're gonna search another searcher. So we have two different follow-ups in our hand. We have four more interactions on our field and we're just in a really good situation. We have battle protection thanks to Wall Shadow plus Shadow Ghoul. And this is like the best Gate Guardian has ever looked. I've never seen a better two card Gate Guardian combo than with Scareclaw. Scareclaw is the only thing I think that has surpassed this, but the reason why Scareclaw is less consistent is because Scareclaw relies on Prisma. This deck relies on one of six cards, which is either your Piri Rai Map or your Asteria plus Wall Shadow or Shadow Ghoul. And it's not like one dimensional either. Like you can open Rosette and Rosette can be a starter. You can open Sylve and Sylve can be a pseudo starter. You can open Legend of the White Forest and double Wall Shadow. There's actually a lot of different ways where you can get to a similar situation without it being like perfect, but pretty damn close. So here is the Whitewood deck list that I came up with. The triple Perry Rymap, triple Asteria, triple Rosette, because these are our starters. Triple Syl, because she's a pseudo starter, she's okay. One Rasia, just because she's only an extender and she gets to summon herself back from graveyard so she's fine at one double legend of white force i don't want to hard draw into this when i don't have the starter lines so i figured two is the best number one for going first one for follow-up one woes of the white force there is another white force card 
that we're not playing just because that one's purely for going second. It's not a good going first card. So I decided to cut it and just to keep the trap card in the list. Next, we have our Gate Guardians Potion Trap cards. I think Jirai Gumo is the best one out of the three because it can play around Droll and it could also be a good disruption if you put one of your monsters into the extra monster zone. It's still only a one of, right? One Dark Element just for follow up and for like a late game scenario. If you have like a Wind and Water in Graveyard, just pay half, summon out Gate Guardian combined. Ryoku Guardian. This is the one where I'm still kind of 50-50 on it, but we do play Triple Piri Rai Map. Worst case scenario, we can send it for one of our White Wood monsters, but best case scenario, we can search it off of Thunder and Wind to go for game. So it's like either we discard it to search a name or we, you know, search it to go for game. The next is Triple Shadow Goal, Triple Wall Shadow, one terraforming, one of each element. And man, it's so sad because if these three were normal monsters, this deck would be so much better. And I, I need to emphasize it really is tough how much this deck suffers because these three are effect monsters rather than normal monsters. If these were normals, we could use a new primordial support to bring them out from deck. There's so many more ways we could get access to these cards. But because these are effect monsters, we kind of have to take what we can get. And they're all like different too. Like they're they're all like different stats. The only thing that's shared between them is that they're all level seven. That's the only thing in common that they have. And that's not a good thing to have in common. So the one reframing, and then we have our uh, 10 non-engine, including our one Mulchummy, Perulia. And this is like the max C replacement. So the White Woods are coming in um, Infinite Forbidden, and this card will be in the set as well. So I'm assuming like, yeah, you know, you can probably just play three of these and get away with it. And Imperm's really good here because it's also a spell and trap you can send to resolve your White Woods. I was looking at that new pseudo Ash Blossom trap card. Unfortunately, we do use dark monsters because although all the White Woods are light, Shadow Ghoul is a dark. And I don't want to risk not being able to play my turn simply because I resolved a low impact hand trap. So I don't think it's worth the risk to play this going second maybe it can be still be worth it like if you're playing it going first but i don't know also if you kind of notice there we did have the ability to go for crimson dragon because we had a level four tuner plus we had crystal wing which is a level eight synchro we could have went for crimson dragon plus ultimaya and that could have put us on a cosmic blazar or calamity line if we really wanted to but i didn't want to promote that kind of play at the moment just because i think it's not necessary if Calamity isn't necessary, I'm not going to go for it. I think Blazar would be a safer bet. If you want other monsters, you could summon off for Ultimaya. I think uh, Meteor Burst is pretty good. I'm trying to find a way to go for Dispater. I think Crimson Dragon's the only way to go for Dispater with like Chaos Angel, but I, I believe that's it. We got Manadium Prime Heart, which like, because we can make it using two tuners, just like Vesis Emritara. And so Emritara. And so Prime Heart could be like a decent level 10 if you only have like your tuner synchros and your level four tuners then prime could be like a good like late game card you can you can probably cut uh these two from the extra deck and probably find something else but i think like maybe you can cut one of these but i think like everything up to here is like a staple you can argue maybe you only need one combined but i i like the ability the idea of using dark element so maybe combined can stay also like sp little knight um apo you have no restrictions on synchro summoning or any kind of summoning condition. So the world is your oyster in terms of uh, white woods. I just think the synchros are like the best way to go about it. I'm also a little sad and a little confused because this has been a V jump card that we have not had in the TCG since last year. I really thought this was going to come in battles of legend and this would have been the perfect card to play in play in this variant of gate guardian because it can mill the names from deck and then you can send send it off with your white wood monsters so that it can make a combined a lot more consistent. Unfortunately, it just seems like Konami doesn't care about this card at the moment. It might come in or might be imported in Infinite Forbidden, but if it's not, then we may have to wait, you know, God knows how long, maybe Rage of the Abyss or another Battles of Legends set next year. No idea when this card's coming over to TCG is what it is. Also, I was looking at Krishnerd Witch uh, simply because it's a light spellcaster but this is more for Ashen than it is for Gate Guardian. Multi-Universe could be a cool card, but you know, there's really no way to search it other than Terraforming. I don't want to play Wind and Thunder. It might be a better card to play than Ryoku Guardian, per se, just to have as like an interaction. So if you want to take a, like Ryoku Guardian out and put this in, I think that's fine, but I don't think you should be playing more than three of the Gate Guardian spells and traps because these 
in a way are also bricks as well like jure gumo is the only one where you can say like it's not entirely a brick it, it's kind of like its own thing but these two are definitely bricks that's been gay guardian whitewood this has been your boy nisho here hope you guys enjoyed let me know what you guys think about whitewoods in the comment section below and i'll see you guys in the next one